There we go. Welcome, Danny. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I guess I should uh, start by introducing myself. I'm Danny Sauer. I'm an SRE at Kong. Um, uh, I'm going to be, I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we, uh, how Colin and I, um, Colin's on the call here elsewhere, um, set up the, uh, set up pulp uh, within our environment to serve packages. And then I'll hand off to uh, a colleague who I don't think is here yet, but will be here uh, in, in a couple minutes, uh, Joshua, to talk about the, uh, the script that we use to put packages into pulp. Um, but uh, to start off with uh, the installation thing. Um, so I'll give a little background on on our environment and you know how we ended up here. Um, we were uh, we need to distribute our software in uh, a number of different formats. We've got um, RPMs, uh, Deb packages, um, we have Alpine packages, um, and we have a number of just kind of arbitrary files that have to be handed out to customers and uh, for various reasons, you know, license files, that type of thing. Um, the previous solution we were using had an API that would generate the repo metadata upon file upload. So we wanted to maintain that so that the developers don't have to know anything about the repo. They just make a package and send it. Um, we're, uh, our, the infrastructure that we manage is, it, it's, it's mostly AWS stuff. Um, generally things run in EKS. So we need something to run in Kubernetes on EKS. Um, and because we're a software company, um, it's really helpful to have metrics on, you know, what's, what's being downloaded, uh, you know, who, who downloaded it, what was downloaded, you know, how long did it take them to download that, that type of thing. Um, all that together, uh, we looked around at a number of different solutions, um, nothing fit real well. Uh, we actually started writing our own and uh, had a question about how to do something with the Debian archives and stumbled across Pulp while I was looking to find an answer there. And it's like, oh, hey, this, this is way better than my my shell script was going to be. Um, so uh, moved forward with that. Um, so started setting it up. Uh, I say the first question is, you know, how are we going to get this installed? Um, you know, there's the sort of the, looks like the preferred mechanism is uh, Ansible, but we don't use Ansible for anything else. And uh, didn't really want to set up uh, individual uh, container, uh, you know, OSs to, you know, virtual machines or whatever to run Ansible against. Um, we briefly looked at the Kubernetes operator, um, but at the time that was uh, that market was not production ready. Um, I haven't looked at it since to see if that's changed or not. Um, and there was an all-in-one container that you know that's for like demo use, but also not so much production ready. Uh, but we did stumble across someone that had already made um, uh, per-image containers. Um, it's, you know, they, they, uh, I don't know if that was, this was originally part of the project or if uh, it was a third party thing, but uh, there's a, there's a base container. So, you know, you do the, the, the basic pulp install in there and then there are separate containers for the, you know, the API server and the content server and the management servers that just launch the different components as the entry point. Um, that seemed like it would be a pretty good fit for what we did. So we forked that re repo. Um, brought it up to date and uh, applied a number of modifications. Uh, that one uh, is, is actually open source. Uh, so, you know, our fork is up there. Anyone can grab it, use it, uh, change it uh, or whatever. Um, and then uh, we made a Helm chart in-house to, to do the deployment of that, uh, that piece. Um, we use, we don't, we use Helm for some things, or we use Helm compatible things to deploy a lot of the stuff. Uh, so this this made a lot of sense for us. Um, someday, I'd still I'd like that to be a, an open source thing as well, but uh, it's pretty Kong specific right now. Um, so we have, we haven't uh, we haven't pursued the the legal challenges of making that uh, that available yet. Um, maybe someday. Um, I was watching the the Dynaconf thing from a couple of days ago and I wanted to call that out as <laughs> it was very convenient that, that that's in there because you know all, all the instructions uh, or the documentation all talks about you know editing the config files it's super handy that you know you can, we can do all that stuff as just environment variables instead of having to modify the uh, the configs um, you know was with, with Helm you just you know you drop it in a you know a, a, a values file and it just shows up. We don't have to change the image or whatever, or map a config map into you know in as a config file or it's 
this, this was very, very convenient. Um, so since we were doing a kind of non-standard install, um, we ran into a, a few a few challenges um, through that. Uh, and in no particular order, uh, authentication was something we needed to do. So we have some, uh, well, I guess I'll start with the API here. Um, we didn't want to manage a, a, an application specific user database. Um, you know, it, it, it'd be kind of a pain to put that all in, in, in either a Git repo or in a secret somewhere and map that in. Um, as it turns out, everyone that we want to have access to the API is, a, is effectively an admin. Um, so what we ended up doing is uh, uh, authenticating users at the ingress point, have the ingress set um, the, you know, the remote user header to just admin for everyone. Um, and then you know, set up the, the, the auth back end to just you know, ignore users and just, just trust whatever was in the header. Um, so this, this works out really nicely for us. Um, and uh, we also need some authentication for content. Um, not all of the software is universally available. Um, so what we do is uh, we store the content in S3 um, and use uh, pre-signed URLs for everything. Uh, we use the prefix of the repo to determine if authentication is needed or not. So we have like a like a slash private and a slash internal for you know that that goes on all the packages that are either internal use or whatever. Do authentication at that point, and if we have something that uh, that a customer, you know, that's like a customer specific build or something like that, um, we can just have someone, you know, one of our support people, uh, authenticate with their credentials. Um, copy the URL that's going to get redirected, that they'll get redirected to and share that, that pre-signed URL with the customer. And then they've got, you know, got a week to do the download, which works out really nicely uh, for us. Um, one of the drawbacks of the, uh, the, the pre-signed URLs is uh, uh, it comes from CloudFront. Um, we originally, you know, thought we'd, you know, stick a CD in front, in front of this and we could have, you know, locally, available downloads, you know, where we are in the world. Uh, unfortunately, we found out after we'd implemented that, that uh, CloudFront signing works differently than S3 URL signing. Um, CloudFront um, uses, uh, uh, hashes the entire URL as it appears and uses that in the, the signature to uh, verify that the user has access. Whereas in S3, um, prunes everything off uh, after the, the question mark in the URL. So the query string is uh, is irrelevant. Um, that's important because some clients, um, the, the Ubuntu and Debian, uh, up until the most recent release in the HTTP module, renormalize URL. So they, they unescape some characters, re-escape some other, you know, in, the HTML in, in, into TFI, um, different things, which breaks the CloudFront signature, but doesn't break the S3 signature. Um, uh, we talked to the, you know, I've, I've got a PR open with Boto3 to change some of the things that are escaped and engage our database support, but uh, that that has not yet been been fixed. Um, I'm not holding my breath that it'll it'll ever be fixed, but um, S3 is working out okay now, uh, so that's that's what we're doing. Um, one of our big things was uh, metrics, uh, so um, logging was important. Um, the uh, green unicorn logs uh, it's it's interesting they're 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 not you know common log or combined log format they have most, most of the fields but they're in a in a weird order you know that's that's not hard to fix but uh, um, because we're not you know directly exposing pulp to the internet uh, we also don't have the you know the client IP we just have the ingress IP because it's a you know it's a proxy um, so we add, we add the header in and we have to log that um in s3 you know we, we could use those logs pull those out of you know and use the you know all the aws friendly log management tools but it only sees the weird internal name um that's you know the the deduplicated uuid ish name uh so that that also wouldn't quite work for us um from the pulp perspective it's just generating a, a, a redirect so it doesn't know how long the downloads took uh, so what we ended up doing is uh, 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 submitting a PR to add in pulp the uh, request file name to the location header that gets generated 
when the uh, uh, when the location uh, when it generates the redirect, <laughs> it sticks the, the the request file name in there. So then it appears in the query string that has three C's. So we can pull that out of the logs on the AWS side. Um, so we end up with everything we need in in the S3 logs, which is handy. Um, I think that got integrated, so that's available to everyone now. Um, you know, we do need to upgrade. It's a, you know, it's a fast moving project. You know, there, there haven't been a lot of security bugs or anything that required upgrading, but you know, it's nice to stay up to date. That's mostly gone smoothly. Um, we had one, uh, I don't remember the version. Um, I may, I may, uh, I may defer to Joshua on that later here, but, uh, it broke the, the way we're generating the open API information in our, our script. Um, I I just don't remember the <laughs> which version it was. Um, it's uh it's also a little challenging to to keep up with. You know, it's it's a fast moving project, and there are a lot of pieces. Um, and this is this isn't you know isn't a full time job <laughs> to to maintain pulp for, for me. Um, we've got Dependabot working well in the container repo. Um, it finds uh, you know the the Python depths and opens PRs and you know we've got some automation that merges that in so that that all works fairly well. It doesn't seem to always pick up the 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 modules. It usually gets pulp core when there are updates, but I don't I don't know if it's just because I've got too many PRs open by Dependabot or if it's you know if if there's something special about them that it's it's not noticing the upgrades or precisely what that is. Um, but uh, I'm not always getting the alerts there for for like you know the, the rpm or the dev module um and depending about is kind of haphazard with uh, uh it doesn't care about dependencies when it, <laughs> when it opens the pr it's like hey there's a new version of this module opens a pr yeah it's not going to build because something else depends on an older version um, so that's not a complete solution but uh we're currently working on some some better automated acceptance testing so that uh we can you know maybe we can we can have a computer do all this work and less less work for for us. Um, publishing content to pulp was uh, you know initially a little bit of a, a challenge. Um, it's not terribly bad uh, thanks to the script that uh, that Joshua will talk about here momentarily. Um, the repo metadata signing. Still has a, a bit of mystery around it. Um, we got we got RPM metadata signing working uh, fairly early on. Um, we and by we I mean Joshua um, are currently working on uh, the Debian metadata signing. I think we're we're getting pretty close to having that actually working. But uh, that's a place where maybe a little bit of documentation might might be handy, um, which leads into places where uh, documentation could have been uh you know, there, there, there's some room for improvement um during the setup in particular um you know there, there's there's a bit of a learning curve um so uh you know one of the things that would have been nice to have seen are some uh, uh some complete examples um like in the modules there there's there's documentation with examples there are scripts but they're uh they're basically just pulled out of the test scripts for the the modules um so that it requires a little bit of digging to <laughs> to figure out the actual process, um, and you know I understand why, but you know, say they did be it'd be handy to to have a uh, you know just complete examples in there. Um, monitoring and health checks, you know what 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 do we do with this service once it's up and running? How do we keep track of you know the, the service is actually behaving? Um, there 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 could be some guidance on that, um, which we, we we may end up contributing back. Um, in particular, uh, uh, one of the other guys on my my team is working for uh, on a, a health city endpoint with it, just a Django plugin. Um, yeah, you know, like be stuck on an arbitrary URL and give us the the, the uh, you know status. You know, is the database connected and that that type of thing. Um, and uh, how do you scale this up? Um, now that that's I, I think I've seen that asked on the the mailing list a couple times. Uh, you know, some 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 guidance on scaling might be something that'd be um, 
yeah, Ryan, I'll, uh, we'll certainly be contributing this when it's, <laughs> when it's wrapped up. Um, yeah, scaling is a is a thing that's that, that you know. Say we weren't sure exactly how to do. We're like, I don't know. We'll just throw a bunch of instances of content, and you know, hopefully that'll work. And it's worked so far. <laughs> um, and some of the the usage of documentation, you know, like I already mentioned, you know, that uh, uh, navigating the API is, you know, it, it's it, it, it's a steep initial learning curve. You know, what you know, what's what's a publication versus a you know a repository version. You know, how do you you know. Uh, how do we stick a package in? What's an artifact? Um, I was a little surprised there wasn't a UI when we, <laughs> when we got in there. But uh, um, you know, once once you work with it for a while, it all starts to make sense. So that's that, uh, I think that's that's just something you just have to do. Um, and like I mentioned, yeah, you know, maybe some minimal examples of how to use the API would be convenient. One of the things that uh, you know, it comes up occasionally is, you know, how do, how do I delete a package or, hey, we uploaded a package. Um, eh, crap, we left something out of it. We need to add another. We need to replace that one before anyone gets it. Um, or uh, or the repo metadata thing that, you know, we've, we're have we still working on. Um, I think those, those are those are a couple places that, that might be handy. Um, but, uh, you know, I complain a lot here. It sort of sounds like, but uh, the uh, the community has been fantastic. Um, you know, the everyone I've interacted with, you know, involved with the pull project has been been helpful. Um, you know, uh, you've been very welcoming with uh, suggestions um, uh, or or just uh, just questions. Um, you know, when I've opened PRs against the project, you know, we've gotten you know useful constructive feedback. Um, they've all you know they've generally been integrated where they make sense. Uh, so that that's that's all. Thank you, you know, for you know, for for making it uh, making it easy to work with uh, with the group. Um, and uh, that that is the end of my piece. Um, I think uh, Joshua. Yeah, it looks like you're you're here, Joshua. So perhaps we can uh, we'll share this off to you. Let you uh, get into your part about the script. And... Cool. Thanks, Danny. How do I I'm presenter? Just have to click the button here, right? Yeah, hopefully it'll work. It's the button to the right of the hand. There you go. And you can whoop. Can you see that? Yep. Now? Yep, yep, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Joshua. I'm working as a uh, software engineer on Kong, and I was tasked to write the uh, you know, user-facing bits of this whole thing that uh, Danny just explained. So, so first of all, we had a couple of requirements because you know we have multiple products: uh, our gateway product, Kuma, and Somnia, and multiple things. And obviously, those things also are released on different platforms, Ubuntu and uh, RHEL and whatnot. So, um, and also obviously on different versions of these platforms. So, before that, we were using uh, bin tray, and you know every team has had basically their own their own implementation of you know how to get package A to you know being exposed to a user. So this time, this should be relatively tool agnostic, so you, that, you, that you end up having something that uh, can be embeddable in your CI/CD system. Obviously, item potency comes into mind if you talk when you talk uh, about CI/CD things. Um, uh, and also, uh, this is also something that Danny mentioned already. We have internal releases, external releases, something that uh, should be behind uh, or, uh, authentication. And something that should just be you know, publicly facing. Um, so to achieve this, uh, we have we evaluated, evaluated a couple of things. So first of all, the the one with the most examples is just bare HTTP calls, putting that into bash scripts and call it a day. Um, the second thing that we also evaluated for quite a time was uh, the pulp CLI. Um, also, have the HTTP calls wrap it into a sort of a library. 
and um, you know use it from there on implement your own workflows um, or the fourth options is to generate your client library from the open API spec so to uh, to give a bit of insight in the, in the decision process so the HTTP calls way is you know great for a very simple approach obviously and you find a lot of examples but it not really feasible when it becomes bigger and you know testability and debugging purposes is it's uh, always a thing when bash scripts grow too big i think everybody knows that <laughs> Oops. um and then the pulp cli this was very from the get-go a very strong contender um because it already implements the things that uh, you will end up doing anyways like waiting for a task to finish and you know this is cleaning an orphan finding repository listing and all that kind of stuff um so and also you know keep in mind that evaluating evaluating happened in like february this year february or march so maybe some things have changed in the, in, in the meanwhile but at that time um it wasn't really complete so debian support was not entirely missing but lacking and i think it still is um and there would be still a lot of work to do for the custom workflows and i put them as an example here the item potency part so uh, but the, the 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 list grows bigger so just to have like one workflow say you know upload this one to there and don't care about anything else this would still be the same thing so the last thing that we had a look at is uh well not the last last but this one as well was also an option so just the HTTP calls write your own library but then it kind of it's kind of the same you gain flexibility but you have basically the same effort as a pop seal has and you know it just felt a bit wrong um to like re-implement re something that could be generated for you also there was a bit of time pressure because uh, you know this sunset of uh, bin tray was a bit aggressive I think. um so this left us with the last option which is um the uh, generating code um uh, just python because you know it's a very easy scripting language i had a bit of ex uh, experience for it and um, this also gives you very easy updates if the specification changes obviously and it allows where it allowed me to focus on the actual workflow that we want to implement rather than on writing the library um unfortunately there is it is a bit weird the code that falls out of it um you have i had to like add like five six seven different patches that you have to constantly apply on top of it and yeah so we picked this and I gotta say I'm, I'm relatively happy with it. So we, uh, I, I linked in here, it's the open API tools, open API generator. And so the way that we, that we do it, if you're unf unfamiliar with this is we just, we fetch the spec file from uh, one of our instances, dash dev stage prod, generate the code. And then, you know, for the things that I just mentioned, we apply the custom patches and um, there we go. Uh, apply the custom patches, um, run the tests that we have, uh, so unit tests and also integration tests, and then uh, start to use this library. And it worked out pretty good. And then if you know, if you uh, decide to release a new version for, for pulp, you just repeat the process and then you have your client library. So to uh, reiterate on the on the design a bit before I go into you know how we did it. So multiple products, multiple platforms with multiple versions. Uh, you don't want to know how the tool functions. You want to be able to embed it into a CI/CD system without potency, and you know pass in arbitrary flags like internal releases publish it or not external whatever so this leaves us with an interface that you know, basically takes a product a product name a 
product version, uh, the operating system and the operating system version, and then you put in some flags. So that's how it looks like for us. Um, as I said, it's a Python script slash tool packaged into a container and then redistributed in our uh, central um, containers re container registry. So, and then this is just the tool that, that is being used by all our um, internal departments. So the way this works is that I just abstracted away the, um, the, the type so that the user don't have to really care about, you know, if, if it's a DAB or whatever, it just falls out of the CI CD and then you pass it inside and it deduces, you know, the target distribution and, and which type it should be. And then the version and it picks everything for you, uh, handles the repository creation, you know, item potency, if it's already there, it just fetches it, uploads the artifact, pushes it into the right content. Also what, what I notice is that it's kind of inconsistent between RPMs, dabs, and files. So for some, I can't remember the details here, but you, on, on, for example, the signing services, correct? You, you have to put this into a publication, while for the other one, you have to put into a distribution or into a repository. So it just abstracted, it abstracts it away from, from the user and puts in the item potency. So currently this is not opened up to the public, this script, because it still has a lot of weird things and possibly some internals. So, but uh, I can certainly put in a bit more effort to make this uh, a public if there is interest for it. Um, so yeah, so all over this went relatively smoothly. Um, I just have, you know, small wish list. So when implementing this, this, it feels like that uh, probably everybody that builds such a system around it is doing more or less the same. And I, I get that the workflows for, um, for each individual company or user is kind of different, but still it shares, you know, some similarities. Um, so if it could be a bit more, you know, workflow centered, be it, you know, just by providing a proper documentation or just have the pulp CLI doing, doing a bit more, you know, it, it should maybe hold your hand a bit more, but I don't know. And uh, management tasks, they seem to be really uh, difficult, unnecessarily difficult. For example, just removing or rolling back one single artifact that you don't really know of where it's located so you have to you know do a reverse search and then find it and then get all the repositories and do get, access the repository version object and then roll it roll a version back or something like this it, it feels a bit complicated and if you as danny also said before the more you think about it the more it makes sense but still it's it it's uh, can be quite hard um right and also i mean the, the the client bindings that we generated with the open api generator they were great and if this is something that maybe can be hosted in the pulp project that would be also cool so that no, not everybody needs to do this themselves um yeah that's about it i think that was all my slides. Thanks. Great. So, Grant, I see you have a question. Uh, just a general comment, Josh. In terms of of how useful the script would be to the general user, and and you know, making it making it more like that, that would be outstanding. But I'll just say, just for my own personal um, uh, selfish reasons, I would love to see it just because it you know looking at what you found necessary to do would be very informative in terms of all oh, right now i need to get my head away from i'm building specific api calls and, and into i don't know how pulp works i just needed to do its thing what's important to you so 
even a, a proto version of that where you do like whatever the minimal amount is necessary for you to make that public would be useful even if it isn't a okay this is bulletproof enough that i'm willing to let people use it um but it's outstanding i would love to see the the process that you're going through sure i will make a note and uh, make sure to publish it somewhere thank you grant um and ina you have a question comment yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, just show on one of your slides, you mentioned that you have um, some pages on top of upstream. And I was wondering whether these pages are very specific to uh, to your product or you've been submitting some PRs and they just didn't get accepted or you plan to submit PRs. Can you this, give some more information if possible? Sure, this was mostly there were mostly patches regarding the weirdness that the open API generator does. So for example, we don't use basic auth in some scenarios, but since open, uh, since basic auth is configured, you know, when, so the thing reads the open API spec and it's there, but we don't use it and it puts it in. So the library, you, there is no way around the, saying the client library that you don't have credentials. So you just write a patch, comment that line out and apply the patch after it, the whole, the whole thing was generated. So that was one example and, uh, adding a debug flag in it isn't native, natively supported because it obviously doesn't know where to put it. So I have like my own patch that just adds a flag. Um, then there was there was some weird thing going on with like object conversion for specific types i think this is just a bug in the open eye generator and but there is just you know the need for a patch and so i think yeah. this is not something that that that's uh, a fault of pulp it's just a it's just a, a result of having a very generic generator taking a open API spec and just doing the right thing. I think that's. Yeah, so you pretty much answered my question already because I, I was going to say that we publish the Python uh, libraries to PyPI, um, but I can definitely see that they're not uh, meeting your needs. And when you say you apply patches, do you use uh, custom templates that open api generator lets you supply or do you uh do a search and replace or something like that after you've generated the code i just do git patches so it will okay. just generate the code it sits into a it sits in a git repository and then just do git patch apply and then it just goes cool through. okay uh we do some modifications and we use custom templates that are fed into open api generator and that's just as another way of modifying what is produced by open api generator so cool. just throwing it out there as a suggestion worth looking into so yeah and, you, and i can link you to an example of it of where we are doing it in our ci yeah. also the, the one thing that i wanted to mention is that um if you plan on doing this because we ran into this um, before generating it, make sure that the open API spec is sorted <laughs> because otherwise you will constantly be notified that there is a change in the file, although it isn't because it's not deterministically sorted. So when you download it from pulp, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, I guess that's a bug with pulp sending it in a non-deterministic way. <laughs> that's definitely a bug in pulp. Okay, yeah, we, we because we pre sorted and then generate it because otherwise it will constantly tell you that there are changes and you should regenerate it, which is not true. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, guys? So, yeah, yeah. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead Mike. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'll go. So, yeah, first time I'm like really impressed on everything that you all built with Pope, and I'm very impressed about 
that you built with like very little information because I know that we had some like IRC conversation, but yeah, it was like very few conversations and you could like figure out everything. But I think the main question that I have seen so many users like giving up on installing Pope, it's uh, what made you so motivated on like defeating all obstacles to get Pulp running? Well, I, I... I want to say it was uh, it, it, you know, it, it was clearly the best product. Um, <laughs> it was definitely worth the time, um, and I, you know, and I, I don't, I don't not believe that. But it was mostly uh, Bintray announced they were going away, um, and you know, we had like three months. Um, we uh, we <laughs> picked a road, and uh, there was not time to <laughs> go down a different road. Um, you know, and this this ultimately did fit everything we needed. Uh, it was just, uh, you know, it was just a matter of figuring out uh, a bunch of little things. Um, so it, 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 you know, you know, it, it worked out pretty well. I, I, you know, between the between Colin and I, I think uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say he's smart. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you know that. It checked enough of the boxes, and there weren't anything, any other solutions out there that really fit well um, and were free. <laughs> Great. Um, Mike, I know you were, um, Matthias got the hand up first, but I know you were, I know you yeah. were kind of second, so I'll, I'll yeah. call on you. Yeah, so, uh, so we, in the installer, as well as I think the operator too, we, we have a special web server. We have a special web server image, and we had to do a special web server image slash container because we couldn't adapt any existing one for the our cost our configs that the plugins need. How? What have you been doing for a web server to tie together the API and the content? So, um, we just run two separate. We, we're we're just using the say the 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 green unicorn, you know, out, out of the box. It's and each one is behind a separate, uh, a separate host name. We just have you know, API dot, whatever is the ingress that goes to the the API server and uh, uh, downloads. Uh, it's downloads Kong HQ common. It's a public website. Yeah, uh, it just points at the content server. We got the content at the root of that that web service and uh, the API server at the at the root of the API service. I see. I think it's certain plugins that need them to be tied together. I think it's like the Ansible plugin that needs it. Or no, the, I, we actually tried. To, it's fun. It's interesting that you've said this because we've tried to enable this use case, but we haven't had confirmation that I know of of someone actually using it, which is kind of like a, a host name split of the services, um, which I think is what I'm hearing that you've done. And yeah, that's great. Yeah, and what plugins are you using again? Uh, we're using the RPM, the deb, the file, and uh, that. Well, we have the Docker one enabled, but uh, I don't. Yeah. I don't think we have anything in the. Yeah. The Docker one. Yeah, we're, we're specifically not using the Ansible. On the I'll have to check. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to check if the hosting split works for those. Uh, works for other plugins than the ones you're using. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Matthias, please. Yeah, uh, you said you had content that is served for specific uh, audiences and that it needs to be restricted. And uh, I don't know if this is a question, it's more, probably more like a um, note. And we already had it in the chat briefly. I believe this is something that uh, can be handled by content guards in Pulp. This may involve writing new ones for specific use cases, sure. But have you considered looking at them? We we did look at the the, the content guards um, briefly. Uh, our specific case, um, uh, we don't really want to have to share credentials with uh, you know uh, an individual customer. 
Uh, cause then, then that's, that's, that's a, that's an authentication pair, you know, it's a username password pair or some sort of credential that has to be maintained essentially forever. Um, and one of our goals was to not have to maintain any authentication information uh, within the application itself. Ideally, we should be able to tear, you know, tear the pulp install down and, and install a new one and have it still just work. Um, and so that that's that's where we ended up with the uh, the signed URLs. It turns out all of our restricted downloads are either internal customers who are like you know testing a beta release or something, or uh, external customers who can just download the file once from, uh, you know, with, with like a, with a sign with the pre-signed URLs, that seven day window is sufficient where they, you know, they can pull it down, put it in their management system and they don't need it again. Thank you. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, Grant, please. I mean, I'm just, what I'm hearing, and it's not just from y'all, Danny and Joshua is we've been pulp has been concentrating on you know getting getting pulp 3 working and um, you know, supplying all these features the next stage for us sounds like getting up a level into um uh making it more as you guys have are, have to build your own scripts for um a higher level of i just want to do this job and yes it's going to take 27 http calls but i don't want to have to know all of them um, so I, to me, that 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 sounds kind of like a, a challenge call to the pulp team for this next year, for 2022, is how do we make the these common use cases easier for the pulp user? Um, I think oh the God. CLI yeah. is attempting to do yes. some of this, and that's that is part of my thought is we were that we really want to want to start doing some of these higher level workflows where the CLI. You can talk to it and say, "I want to do this one thing," and the CLI knows how to do the deconstruction into talking to the to the all the API calls as necessary. Um, the other the other question I had is the more that we we've kind of of um, picked your brains a little bit on your configuration. I would love to to know more about what your installation looks like, you know, all the pieces, parts. You've talked about it some, but I'd love to see a diagram at some point. I don't know if this is this is obviously not the right place, but I'd love to see a diagram of, yeah, this is how we're installing and using Pulp. Um, here's all the nodes that we have. Here's what we call them just at the top level. Um, because I think that would really, again, that would be something that I would look at and go, well, yeah, I, you, I guess you can do it that way. Who, who could have imagined? <laughs> so, um, if you ever have such a document um, that you can you can afford to make public, let me know. I would love to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd be happy to share something with you. I think that I don't think there's any problem with that. Cool, very cool. Anyway, yeah. thank you. This has been great. I love hearing all this. And as I, as I said, Danny, um, I offered Danny that if he if he even got us over like a a pencil a pencil drawing, that um, I'd be happy to mock it up into something I think it would be totally worthwhile exercise and for some work I'm doing at the moment uh, for the website I'm looking I'm I'm looking everywhere for for exactly that so if you can get it to me in any kind of primitive form I'll I'll do the rest uh, myself um, so that that offer remains um, after this meeting and uh, Brian please you have a question comment um yeah uh, um Grant, you set this up very well for me because I agree completely that I think over the next 12 months, we should really, the best way we can serve our users is to focus on um, helping them understand the 30 things that Paul already does, um, you know, at the expense of developing the 31st thing. And of course, obviously we're gonna develop some new things. There's roadmaps, we're gonna do them, but that's, that's I think that's a great theme. Um, so that leads me to my question, which is, um, uh, I think we all do, but I certainly want to improve with the examples of um, how do you do all these things in that part of your presentation, which I love, by the way, um, and appreciate hearing everything that you guys have done. Um, you know, having better examples, I think, is key to success. So one of the things that we've struggled with is that um, there are all these general concepts that are provided by Pulp Core, but you can't really use Pulp Core directly. You have to use them and experience them through individual plugins. And so this challenge that we end up with is 
um, we end up kind of writing the same documentation like n number of times. And maybe that's what we should do. Um, those are the concrete examples, because I think what happens when we're tempted to write it in the pulp core area and have better pulp core docs is that everything's abstract. And that I think kind of further underscores the, the problem. I mean, it almost like deepens the very problem we're trying to solve, which is that these things are not understand comprehensible and these abstract docs aren't helping. Um, so I guess, uh, do you have any advice for like, hey, this is what I really wanted? Because it's difficult for me to see. We're too close to the project. I think I think having documented like these really fundamental things, I mean, I think one um, after some time everybody has figured out like how to put their stuff into pulp and expose it to the public. So I think that's not the that's not the hard part. And because then everybody does it different, it's it's also hard to you know make an actual workflow of it. But what I really would have liked is. Um, having uh, how to remove a <laughs> how to remove a package from pulp because you know it's, it's been it's, a theme uh, this week <laughs> yeah. this is a theme thank you go on <laughs> because it's 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 um you know usually you don't really think about it in the first place but when but once you upload something that you really want to have off of the server quickly then you start to look at the internet and you can't think straight <laughs> you because it's you know everybody's panicking and uh, you can't find anything like that's really fitting and uh, it took me quite a while to you know have something scriptable that can be reused the next time and and that's i think probably the same for everybody like this workflow you have a name or, or of a of a file and then you know it finds it and then it removes it while asking questions or that's very specific and that's great because that's actionable. We could do something like that. And the issue that we run in no, that one runs into with this is, and you, you touched on it right there. I need to get rid of a thing. Well, if it's a file repository, you're thinking I have this file name or this relative path that has to go away. If I live in RPM land, it's like, oh, I uploaded this Nevra and I need to change it, but I really don't want to update the Nevra. So I need to make that Nevra go, the existing one go away. And now I'm going to upload a new artifact with the same Nevra. How do I do that? It's the same problem, but it's really easy to have it sound really different depending on where your head lives in, in content land. And I'm sure, and Deb, I'm sure has the same, the same, it's the same problem, but it sounds really different. And I think Brian, this is a place where pulp core can have documentation for how do you get an artifact out of here but for the the i'm panicked because i just found out this this nevra rpm is bad nobody's going to map when they're panicking nevra to artifact you want to have it in the plugin language as well so that's where we may I agree this. i agree completely it has to be in concrete in the plugin documentation Yeah, and it, the 101 page, as, as Fabrizio is pointing out, this is all a lot of what I'm hearing is the 101 page is going to be really important. Not 101, here's how Pulp's ar architecture works, but 101, I have simple jobs to do. Why is it so damn hard? We need to solve that problem. So I'll contribute one of the things that uh, this truck, you know, uh, when, when Colin and I, when we first got it running, was, uh, you know, I went to the content server and I get a blank page. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, okay, <laughs> is, is it broken? You know, and then I look at the source and you know, you figure out what's going on. But that was that was mildly confusing as <laughs> well. You guys have definitely demonstrated to me that you're all very capable engineers. Um, because pulp has a lot of moving pieces and you've been able to make it do many different things. Uh, so I'm really impressed with all the I've seen your presentation today. Yeah, and I agree completely. And I guess part of what I want to, for myself at least, offer is um, I think it's a good thing if um, you guys are, I mean, just to be plain about it, because um, you're not acting this way, but if you were more demanding on us, um, because we have a difficult time 
um, recognizing, but I have a difficult time recognizing a clear opportunity that would help a user. And so if that, that's like the biggest problem that I have on a regular basis. And so, you know, to, to be very clear, like what you just said, um, only in an ongoing basis, <laughs> like, like feel free. Um, you know, we want it better. You want it better. I think that would over quite well. Cool. Uh, thank you, Brian. Grant, uh, you, have, uh, you have something else? Just as a concrete example, Danny, you just mentioned, you know, we got the whole book and then we went to the content page and it was empty. Uh, Wibbit Douglas had mentioned six months ago in their environment, the content page ends up with like 40, 50,000 uh, uh, distributions out there and it doesn't handle it very well. And he mentioned that and I'm, I went to look at the content page and then found out after I'd kind of been playing around in that code that Dennis also had identified that the content server page needed work. Um, but we're all doing this independently. So which so I want to reinforce Brian's point. You know, if you guys come storming into the matrix channel and go, you know what, gang, your content page sucks and here's why. It's a good thing and get an issue open and then then and then nag at us about it because it's like I said, it's really easy to be heads down inside the API, adding a new feature, or making it more performant or whatever. We don't have a really good idea because we don't deal with it every day like you do that. You know, here's this one thing, this one simple trick that would make my life so much easier. Um, but all of us have kind of an idea. So there might be three or four of us working on it independently because we don't think it's important. And then having a real world user come in and go, what the hell tends to focus us. So feel free. Worst that'll happen is we'll look at it and go, that's a great idea. We'll get to it in 2025, but feel free to, to register your needs. Well, to, to that point, um, I, I mentioned the, you know, the health Z endpoint that, uh, that, that we're working on that, you know, I, I hope will be done, you know, in a matter of weeks. Um, I, I do have a patch that uh, is almost ready to submit that uh, alters the, the the layout. You know, that adds the ability to provide a user user provided style sheet onto that that content page. Um, you know, maybe it look a little prettier. Amazing! Uh, Damn, you would have saved me uh -huh. about a weekend's worth of work. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. One thing um, from our earlier sessions, we had um, the the individual responsible primarily for the Debian plugin. He came and he talked about his experience, you know, um, as a plugin writer, you know, interacting with us and interacting, you know, with the project in general and what's difficult, etc. And one thing he mentioned, and uh, you know, uh, this this engineer is around for a very long time uh, within our community, but one thing he mentioned that um, has been positive of late is that he has started to use our open floor meetings. Um, so we have like a, is it, have you returned to the Friday guys or is it still just on a, so it's just a Tuesday. So every Tuesday on Matrix there's um, open floor. So anyone can come along and post anything. And at the moment, for the most part, it is underutilized. So you can add something to the agenda that you want to discuss. Um, the team is there. And um, so there's there's a weekly opportunity to sync with anything that you're, you're looking to explore, or if you need advice on anything, that, that forum is, is there for you, as well as all the other modernized channels we are working on. Okay, doke guys, we're coming kind of close to the top of the hour. Is there any any last questions, any last comments um, before we release Team Kong? Um, sorry, I actually have one last question. Uh, you have been briefly mentioning Helm charts. Um, can you please give more details on uh, how you're using them within Pulp? Uh, that's I mean, it's it's, it's our, our our deployment mechanism. Um, you know that that's that that that's just what we're using to set up our different environments. Um, I don't so know, you, so, so you're not managing or distributing them, right? No, no, no. Oh, no. Okay. 
they're deploying pulp using Helm chart. Okay, yep. okay. Understood. Um, yeah, about that is, uh, do you guys work for someone named Zach Cubby? No. Okay, Zach Cubby also developed a Helm chart. Um, and so, yeah, I asked Zach, he just emailed me this week. Um, I asked him to post on the discourse um, sharing it and um, I'll encourage you all to do the same, um, which, you know, it's probably business confidential stuff and also time and priorities. So, you know, no, no issue if it doesn't happen, but that's my interest is to bring everyone together. Yeah, yeah, it's not so much confidential in there. Is it's just it's it's very specific to our use of you know AWS with you know RDS as the database and you know the the Bitnami you know uh, Redis and you know the, the the way we're setting it up. Uh, you know our ingress. Yep. Would be yep. Of, so. Work works for me. Somebody else could set it up just like you did. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that's cool. I'm just in, so um, interested to hear like in one week. Oh, two people have developed home charts. That's great. Yep. And I'm glad it's working for you. Matthias, I have a please. question on, I uh, just remembered, on your first slide, I think there was a uh, mention that you uh, interact with Alpine content. So is there a hidden APK plugin to pulp anywhere? Or is this like a big feature gap for you? Yeah, we're just using the file module for those. You know, they're just bare files. I was about to say, nice. everything that doesn't fit just goes into file. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I suggest to people. If, if there is no plugin for it, you can probably make use of file. And actually, that firmware, I forget what that. LXD plugin. images. Yeah, they're being distributed using the file plugin. Yep. So, final call. Okay, doc. Um, guys, this session was everything I hoped it would be and more. So, I'd just like to thank you very much for coming along, giving your time. Um, please don't be a stranger. And we hope to see you again at some point soon. And um, as I said, every Tuesday, we're around for some form of chat if necessary so do do make use of it and thank you so much awesome thanks, thanks for having us thanks guys